We spend a lot of time idling gas vehicles at stoplights, and that wastes money, fuel, and pollutes the environment. But how much gas and money is wasted this way? What does it cost you every minute you idle at a light? And how long until you save fuel and money by turning off your engine? And how long do you need to idle to actually cut down on pollution? In this video, we'll use a technique from calculus called related rates to derive a formula that you can use to find out how much gas your own vehicle uses when it idles. And we will use our results to answer questions about the cost and pollution of idling. I was at a stoplight looking at my dashboard and noticed my miles per gallon drop. It made me wonder how fast my Honda Fit runs through gas when I'm idling. Later, at another stop, I timed how long it took my mileage to drop a tenth of a mile per gallon. When I got to work, I did some calculus to find out the rate my car idles through gas. If you have a car that has a trip odometer that also records your cumulative gas mileage, then you too can figure out how fast your car burns through gas when it's idling. The calculus technique I used is called related rates. If you've had calculus before, you might not have fond memories of related rates. One reason is that every single problem in the related rates section of the textbook is pretty boring and meaningless. Who cares at what rate two clock hands are moving apart, and how fast a shadow is growing as a person walks down the street, or the rate at which the top of a ladder moves while the bottom slides out at a constant rate from the wall? Who cares? If we're going to have students learn a technique to analyze real-world situations, let's at least do it with meaningful problems. Okay, stepping up my soapbox on related rates now. So what is the related rates technique? It's quite slick, actually. We're used to dealing with equations, like the gas mileage formula, that shows the relationship between different quantities. In this case, gas mileage, distance traveled, and volume of gasoline. Related rates allows us to create a new formula that shows the relationship between the rates at which those quantities change. A formula for gas mileage is pretty easy. If we know how far we've driven and how many gallons of gas we've used, we divide to find the gas mileage. But this isn't enough to know how the rate that gas mileage changes is related to the speed of the car and the rate that the car burns fuel. We need a new equation. Related rates is the technique that shows us how to find that new equation that relates the rates at which the quantities are changing when we already have an equation that relates the quantities themselves. Related rates starts where we assume that each quantity is changing as time changes. We can represent this by changing each quantity in our equation to be a function of time. Then we take the derivative of the whole equation with respect to time, following the rules we've learned about derivatives. In this case, I'll use the quotient rule. If you'd rather use the product rule, we could multiply both sides by g and take the derivative of g times m equals d. Either way, we get an equation that relates the rates at which these quantities are changing. Each of these terms has meaning in our situation. g and d still represent the same quantity as the original mileage equation. The primes represent the rate of change of the quantity over time. So m prime is the rate that the gas mileage is changing, g prime is the rate that gas is being used, and d prime is the rate that the distance the car has driven is changing. We usually just refer to d prime as the speed of the car. Of all these values, the one that I want to know is g prime of t, because it represents the rate that the gas is being used by the car. If we can get values for all the other quantities in the equation, then I can solve for g prime. Since I was idling, d prime of t which is my speed, is zero. That means I only have three more quantities I need. I will do the calculations with miles and gallons, but a similar process works with kilometers and liters. I had timed my gas mileage dropping from 37.5 miles to the gallon to 37.4 miles to the gallon in 15 seconds while I was at the stoplight. This allows me to estimate M prime, 0.4 miles per gallon per minute. My trip odometer at the time showed that I had traveled 7.7 .7 miles so D is 7.7. .7. Next, I have to do a little calculation to find how much gas I used. I can solve the original mileage equation for G and divide my distance by my mileage to get 7.7 .7 divided by 37.5 equals 0 0.20533 gallons. Plugging in all of these values and solving for G prime gets us a value of 0 0.00219 gallons per minute. If you have a car that records trip miles to the gallon, or something in terms of kilometers and liters, you can use this formula to also find out how fast your car burns through gas while it idles. Honestly, that's not a lot of gasoline for a minute. At $3 a gallon, that's only $0.00657, which is less than a penny per minute. If you're in the Eurozone where gas is much higher, say 1.8 euros to the liter, that's about 1.5 euro cents per minute. Keep in mind, this is for a small car. 
What about my large van that we use to haul around our large family? I gathered data on my van, did the same calculations to find that it burns gas at four times the rate of my little Honda. So instead of about 0.7 cents per minute, it's almost three cents a minute at $3 a gallon. So should I turn my car or van off at a stoplight? Depends on how long you expect to be there. Online, I've seen others estimate values between three to seven seconds. Well, a survey of Americans think that it takes more than three minutes before idling has used the same amount of gas it takes to start a car. Then I found one website that said it takes 1.1 milliliters of gas to start a small car. For my small Honda Fit, that would mean it takes about eight seconds of idling before I burn through the same amount of gas to start my car. So a value closer to the seven or eight second range seems more accurate. Does that mean I should turn off my car every time I think I'll be at a light for more than eight seconds? Not necessarily. Cranking your starter more frequently will lead to more wear and tear on your starter and needing to replace it sooner. So any savings on money and pollution could be canceled out with costs of replacing your engine starter sooner and the increased pollution of manufacturing more engine starters. One person estimated a typical number of cranks on a starter to be about 13,200. Another estimate from a mechanic estimated between seven and 10,000 starts. We'll assume the better case of 13,200 and do some math. Kelly Blue Book estimates a cost of about $775 to replace a starter. So that would mean it would cost about six cents per crank. I would need to sit at a stoplight for about eight and a half minutes to break even for the cost of the starter. Even if we tripled the number of starts on a motor, it'll require a delay of at least three minutes to break even. For my large van, it would take about two minutes before recouping enough gas to pay for the cost of the start. So it isn't the cost of gas to start the car that's the issue. It's actually the wear and tear on the engine starter that gets you. What about these newer cars with auto start stop devices? We'd need data for those specific cars to analyze their efficiency. But if you want to know whether start stop features are worth it, let us know in the comments. We might do a video on them later. Now we know that turning your car off while idling isn't really worth the money, unless your car was designed for that, perhaps. For cars with traditional starters, the cost of replacing the starter is much more than the money you save on gas. But is it still worth it if it cuts down on pollution? Well, just because you don't have the exhaust coming out of your tailpipe doesn't mean you're not polluting. By cranking your starter more often, you'll have to replace it sooner. Then it will require someone else polluting to mine more materials, process them into a starter, and ship it. It just moves the pollution to a different place and time. So how long do you need to idle until turning it off actually cuts down on pollution? I did a back of the envelope calculation for my Honda Fit. An estimated 12 seconds of idling to make up for pollution, eight seconds to make up for the gas needed to start the engine again, and about four seconds to save on the pollution from creating a new starter. That means it is possible to cut down pollution at stoplights since the average time spent at a stoplight in the US is 75 seconds. So turning your car off while at a stoplight won't save you money if you have a car with a traditional starter, but could help cut down on pollution if you're at a light for a long time. One thing to think about is that pollution also has costs. So even if you're saving money by burning fuel, the pollution contributes to costs of health and mortality of others. So please consider turning off your car at lights, especially on bad air days in your area. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share our videos. Be sure to follow Math the World on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for your support.